Well, greetings. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we choose to rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you this morning for joining our broadcast. Today's message is about choosing intimacy with God and making Him our priority. Uh, there are times when life comes at us and it hits us hard, all at once. And it causes us to be distracted, and sometimes it will cause us to be isolated. But God is faithful and always there. And he allows us time to reset and refocus. Join us as we look at being intimate with God over being isolated from God. Bible study Wednesday at 7 p.m. Happy birthday to all of our July born members. How can we pray for you? If you have a prayer request, please send them to care at nazarenebaptist.org. We have three ways to give. You can mail your offering to our P.O. Box. You can give your offering through Tithely to Nazarene Baptist Church. Or you can text GIVE to 833-402-2068.
Hallelujah. Beloved, you know the Word of God encourages us to set our minds on the things above, so to speak. So I would like to encourage you today to set your minds on the things that are above, not on earthly things, but to set your minds and hearts on the things of God, the heavenly things, the things that concerns the kingdom of God. Because life can sometimes get us sidetracked. Life can keep us busy and sometimes life can result in us becoming distracted on what should be our number one priority. And that is Christ Jesus. That means waking up every day and saying, Lord, I am yours. Be praised today. Help me to focus on your word and on your will for my life today. With that said, would you join me now in a word of prayer, seeking that the Lord may help us to set our minds and hearts to focus on Him. Father God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, we humbly bow before you today, for you are the great I Am. Prophet Samuel described you as a rock, a fortress, and a deliverer, the one in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. You are my stronghold and my refuge, my Savior, and I bless your name, Lord, because you, your love is unending. It is in you, Lord, that we find all that we need. You are our provision when we are in need. You are Jehovah Jireh, our provider. You, Lord, are the solution to all our cares as well as our burdens. You are the way where there seems to be no way. So we offer up to you this day a psalm of thanksgiving. The word in Psalms 100 says to make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands, and to serve you with gladness. It is you, God, who has made us and not we ourselves. We are your people and the sheep of your pastor. So we enter into your gates with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise. We are thankful unto you. And God, we bless your holy name, for you are good, and your mercy is everlasting, and your truth endures throughout all generations. Give us a heart that can rejoice and give thanks in our best times, as well as in our worst circumstances. Give us a mindset that is thankful first, a heart that is inclined to appreciate your goodness as well as your mercy. Lord, we invite you this morning to draw close to us as we draw closer to you. You are the giver of all good things, King Jesus. You give us joy unspeakable. You give us victory over the enemy and over all the powers of darkness. You give us the strength to overcome every challenge. And with your grace and favor, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So we will not be dismayed by the things that may go on around us. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would help us to meditate and dwell on the promises of God. Help us in those times where we might get weak. Help us to overcome that fear. And we want to thank you for the power that we can access through your blood. The power that allows us to overcome daily, to be blessed daily, to wake up in the power of your grace and mercy each and every day. King Jesus, we bless your holy name. 
it is through you that we are able to live victoriously with peace in a world that is full of fear. And we thank you and we rejoice because only you, Lord, can save us. You, Lord, the one who listens to all of our petitions and our prayers. God, we just ask that you would help us to focus on your word as well as your will for our lives today. For you are the most high king. And we thank you for hearing our prayers this morning. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Well, praise the Lord and good morning again, everyone. This is the day that the Lord has made and we choose to rejoice and be glad in it. Today's scriptural reference will be coming from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 1, verses 12 through 13a. And we're going to be reading from the uh, New International Version this morning. So if you have your Bibles, would you join me as we read? from the word of God. The word of God reads as thus. I, the teacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. Verse 13 says, I applied my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. The title of our sermon this morning is Intimacy with God Over Isolation from God. Amen. You know, maps can be critical for providing direction, especially when you're in an unfamiliar territory, and especially if you don't have access to GPS. But the only thing worse than having a map when you're in an unfamiliar territory is having the wrong map. Now suppose you wanted to arrive at a specific location in a certain city. A street map of that city would be a great help to you in reaching your destination, wouldn't it? Now suppose you were given the wrong map through an error. The map labeled one thing was actually a map of another town. Now, can you imagine the frustration and the ineffectiveness of trying to reach your destination? Yeah, you may work on your behavior. You could try harder or be more diligent by doubling up your speed, but your efforts would only succeed in getting you to the wrong place just a little bit faster. You might work on your attitude. You could think more positively but you still wouldn't get to the right place. Or perhaps you wouldn't even care. Your attitude would be so positive, you'd be happy wherever you were. The point is this, you'd still be lost. You see, the fundamental problem has nothing to do with the behavior of your attitude, but it has everything to do with having the wrong map. You know, the problem with most motivational books, even sometimes the Christian ones, is that they talk about things like setting goals and persevering and having the right attitude without providing you with the right map. And by maps, I'm talking about the way that we view this thing called life. You know, a geographical map is helpful in getting us from point A to point B. And it's based on a certain geographical reality. Now, in the same way, a spiritual map shows us how to get from where we are to the place where we need to be in our relationship with Christ. And it's also based on certain spiritual realities. Just imagine that you did arrive in a certain city. And instead of asking for a map of that city, you decided to draw your own map. 
even though you have never been there. You decide, you decide it based upon your map on what you wish that city was like instead of what it was actually like. The results would be disastrous. Now, wouldn't it? It's the same thing when we try to create our own spiritual maps. When we try to worship the God of our own understanding. We just make it up in our own reality. Or when we just make up a reality. The end is going to be a disaster. No, we've got to have the right spiritual map if we're going to be successful in life. So today, we're going to talk about one of the most fundamental attitude choices of all the only one that will give you a proper spiritual map of life and that is the choice to choose intimacy with God over isolation from God so if you have your Bibles would you turn with me again to the book of Ecclesiastics 1 and let's look at verses 12 to 13a of, of that chapter it says, I, the teacher, was king over Israel and Jerusalem. I applied my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. And so here Solomon tries three different maps to see if he could find meaning to his life. The first map he used was pleasure. Perhaps experience and pleasure was the key to the meaning of life. Chapter 2, verse 1, he says, Come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. And so in verses 10 and 11, he says, But I denied myself nothing that my eyes desired. You see, he tried everything from wine to laughter to women to great houses, great possessions. And guess what? He came to the conclusion that it was all a chastening after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Here's the key phrase. The key phrase in the book of Ecclesiastics is under the sun. Well, if that didn't work, then what would he do next? Well, here we see Solomon. Solomon thought to himself, he says, you know, I've always been more of a thinker than a playboy at heart anyway. So maybe I'll try something else. Maybe I'll try the pursuit of wisdom. You remember Solomon had always placed a premium on wisdom when he was 20 years old. When he was 20 years old, at the beginning of his reign as king of Israel, remember God came to him and he said, Solomon, I will give you anything that you want. And you know, if you're a 20 year old male, that I'll give you anything you want. <laughs> what do you think that most people would choose at that age? You see, it wasn't any different in Israel at that time because most 20 year old guys would have chosen a flashy chariot or a beautiful concubine or something else like that. But not Solomon. He said, no, he said that I want wisdom. And so guess what? God granted him wisdom and every other thing his heart could want as well. But then he came to the conclusion in verses 14 and 16. He says, but I came to realize that the same fate overtakes the lies and the fool both. And like the fool, the wise man must also die. You see, the fact is, in the end, it really doesn't matter. Dead is dead no matter where you are buried. The same fate overcomes everyone. Verse 15 says, uh, so I said to myself, the fate of the fool will overtake me also. That is, I will die. So what do I gain by being wise? I said to myself, this too is meaningless. Having found no meaning in pleasure or in wisdom, he tried work itself. Maybe if I throw myself into work, that'll provide meaning. Verses 18 and 19 says, I hated all things. 
I had to toil for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether that person will be a wise man or a fool. Yet he will have control over all the work into which I've poured my efforts and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. Everything we have, everything we achieved is going to be left behind. And it really doesn't matter what treasures you're spending your, on your life to acquire, pleasure, wisdom, or even wealth. Solomon and Jesus both affirm the idiocracy of trading the eternal for the temporal. You know, after this journey, the first 11 chapters of Ecclesiastics, Solomon came to the conclusion that wisdom is futile, pleasure is vain, and work is meaningless. In other words, life is short and death is absolutely certain. And that is why he says over and over again that it is meaningless. Life under the sun is meaningless. But there's the key. It's under the sun. That's a phrase that Solomon uses 29 times here in this book. It refers to life from a horizontal perspective. If we just look at what is around us instead of looking up. If we look at what is around us, life does seem meaningless. It seems frugal. It seems useless. But there's another way to look at life. To look at life above the sun. Here's an example. Have you ever experienced taking off in an airplane when it was gray and cloudy and raining outside? And as you go down the runway, you could see the rain streaks going across the window of your seat. And yet, as the plane goes upward with this in a few moments, and as soon as it gets above the clouds, everything is sunshine. I mean, both realities are true. On earth, it's dark and gloomy. Above the clouds, it's sunshine, but you have both realities that are true at the same time. <laughs> well, the first 11 chapters of Ecclesiastics is under the sun, the meaninglessness of life. But when he gets to chapter 12, he gives the above the sun perspective and look at what he says in chapter 12, verse one. And here's the key to finding meaning in life. He says, remember your creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble, before the days trouble came and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. But remember your creator. What does that mean? That word remember doesn't just mean to call to mind. Like, oh, I remember God. Uh, I'd forgotten him for a while, but now I remember him. What Solomon is saying, the most important choice that we could make is to build our life around Christ. He is the only one capable of giving us the right perspective of life and eternity. But how do you do that? How do you choose intimacy with Christ over isolation from Christ? And as we close out today, let me just share with you some practical principles for making Christ first in your life. First of all, you have to come to the understanding that true fulfillment is really impossible apart from God. You know, nothing will block intimacy more than divided affections. So we have to build our lives around one thing. And not many things. Jesus said it in Matthew 6, 24. He said that no one can serve two masters. You just can't do it. You may think you can, but you can't. He says, for you will either hate the one and love the other, or he will hold on to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And the fact is, if you are under the illusion that a certain position, a certain amount of possessions or a certain amount of prestige or pleasure, that that those things will really provide the fulfillment that you need in life. Then you can't be intimate with God 
and serve him at the same time. You're going to build your life around whatever you think it's going to satisfy your deepest needs. And that means that if you want to have intimacy with Christ, you've got to come to the place where you realize that you cannot be fulfilled any other way. It's only when we come to the point that we realize that fulfillment is impossible apart from Christ. That's when we will begin to build our affections around God. And secondly, to gain intimacy with Christ, you have to honestly evaluate your relationship with Christ. In other words, let's do an, what we call an honest x-ray of the condition of our hearts. What is the center of your affections right now? Hmm? Think about it. Are you building your life around the temporal or the eternal? The things that are temporary or the things that are forever? You know, a good way to really evaluate your heart is to ask yourself the question, how would you respond if suddenly you lose all of your material possessions, you lose your most important relationships, you lose your health or you lose your children. Would your life completely spin out of control at that point? Because there was a person who actually experienced all of that in a very short amount of time. You got it. His name was Job. And we find his story in the Old Testament. Now, obviously, Job was heartbroken after he lost his kids in a freakish windstorm. After all his possessions were taken from him, he began to lose his health. But it didn't undo his life. In Job 1, 20 and 22, it says that Job arose and he tore his robe and he shaved his head and he fell to the ground and Job worshipped. And he said this, he said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked shall I return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. Through all of this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. Job's life was built around something more than what could be taken away from him. But can we say the same things? Have you ever been on a road in an unfamiliar place? And you made a wrong turn and, and, and not soon afterwards you realize that you've made that wrong turn. The question is, would you admit to that mistake? Turn around and go in the opposite direction? <laughs> and there's something inside of us that doesn't always want to do that. Because after all, you've gone a little ways in this new direction and you'd have to retrace your steps and it would take longer to get back on the right road, wouldn't it? I mean, sometimes it's idiotic when we think about it, but it made sense at the time. So you keep going further and further in the wrong direction, hoping that magically somehow it's going to become the right direction. And the further and further you go, the harder and harder it is to turn around and to admit that you have made a mistake. We've all been like that at times. The further you go into the wrong direction, the harder it is to turn around. But you know, that's what the word repent means. Literally, it means to turn around, to be headed in the wrong direction, to acknowledge it and to start going in the right direction. There's some of you that are ready to do that. You're ready to admit that what I've been chasing after, it hasn't done it for me. It hasn't been providing the fulfillment that I've been longing for. And now I'm ready to admit that I've been going in the wrong direction and now I'm ready to go in the right direction. But unfortunately, that didn't happen to Solomon. He waited until it was too late. First Kings 11 Verse 4 says, For it came about that when Solomon was old, 
that his wives turned his heart away after other gods and his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been remember your creator before it's too late and number three how do you build intimacy with God well one of the things you have to do is to remove any barriers in your life that prevents intimacy with God. You know what's the biggest barrier between us and God is that keeps us from having a relationship with him? The biggest barrier is this little word, this little three letter word called sin. That's right. S I N. In Isaiah 59 two, the prophet says, but your iniquities, your sins have made a separation between you and your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear you. He was talking to God's own people, the Israelites. Now, let me be clear about this. When you were born into this world, we were all born separated from God. The wall was already there. It's a wall that is caused by the sin we inherited from Adam. We are separated from God, you say. Well, how do you remove that wall? You can't remove it. I can't remove it. But that's why Christ came to pay for our sins. He's the one who removed that wall and made access to God possible. And when you trust in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, God takes a sledgehammer to that wall and he knocks it down and welcomes us into his presence. But after we become a Christian, we can try to erect that wall ourselves by brick, by brick, by brick. And when we erect our own walls, guess what? You got it. Sin after sin have to sin you see it's not that God changes his attitude towards us but we change our attitudes towards him we grow distant from God the more sin we pile on the more we build and build and build that wall until we can no longer see our creator you know the biggest brick that blocks our view of God it's not adultery it's not murder it's not even thief thievery I mean, those are certainly sins, don't get me wrong, but the one brick that blocks our view of God more than any other is idolatry. Now, some of you are thinking, whew, wow, he named the one thing that I'm not guilty of. Well, you might want to think again, you know, because idolatry is just not bowing down before some wooden statue somewhere. Idolatry is loving anyone or anything more than you love God. That's what it is to have an idol, to be obsessed with, to think about, to love anything or anyone more than we love God. And if you're going to have intimacy with God, we've got to be willing to let go of any idols that are in our lives. And finally, how do we have the right relationship with God to continue to nurture our relationship with God? You see, if we're going to have intimacy with God, we've got to continue to nurture our relationship with God. Here's a formula that absolutely guarantees to destroy any relationship that you have. And it goes like this. Don't ever talk to the other person. Don't ever listen to the other person. And don't even don't ever spend any time with the other person. Guess what? That will destroy any relationship. Now, you may think, well, I've got a great relationship with my spouse or my children or even with my lifelong friends. You may think you have a great relationship, but just stop talking to them for a while. Just don't call them. Don't say anything. Break off all communications. Stop listening to them or spending time with them. And that relationship 
will shrivel up overnight. You see, it's the same in our relationship with God. You know how to destroy intimacy with God? Don't ever talk to him. Don't ever listen to him. Don't ever spend time with him. Because we have to nurture our relationship with God if we're going to be intimate with intimate with him. How do you spend time with God? You know the answers. We talk to God through prayer, telling him what's on our heart. We listen to God by reading his word. We spend time alone with him as often as we can. Now I found that one of the best ways to develop intimacy with God is by keeping a journal. Not a diary, but a journal. Not every day, but just writing down the things that God is teaching us. That I'm learning from him and that I'm keeping a list of prayer requests and the answers that do or do not come. And as I reflect over those journals, it's such a refreshment to me to see that God really does exist and that he's at work in my life. And in a lot of ways, Ecclesiastes was Solomon's spiritual journal. And he left it so that all of us could read it and learn from his mistakes. Solomon said, don't be like me. Remember, God, make him first in your life before it's too late. Solomon's relationship with God had started out so strong. But because he was distracted by the gifts of God, rather than the giver of the gifts, who is God himself, he ended up dying spiritually hungry so don't make that same mistake Solomon says choose intimacy with God make it a priority in your life instead of isolating yourself from God so until next time may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, always. Amen. Grace and peace, everyone. This is Pastor Davis. I pray that the word you heard today not only blessed your life at this particular moment, but I pray that the word you heard has met you at the right time and in the right situation so that you know that you've heard from the Lord Jesus Christ today. And now you have an opportunity to establish a vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ. If you're ready, we encourage you to take that leap of faith and give your life to Jesus Christ. Just simply admit that you're a sinner in need of forgiveness. Then confess your sins. Thank God for Jesus' death on the cross that paid the price for your sins. Then ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life. Pray this with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I'm sorry for the wrong things I've done. Please forgive me. I believe your son Jesus died on the cross for my sins and rose from the dead. Jesus, come into my heart and be my Lord and my Savior. I surrender my life to you. Now, Father, help me to do your will. And thank you again for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. If you prayed that prayer, congratulations. God just gave you eternal life. Please let us know by emailing us at the address below and someone will contact you. We look forward to hearing from you. We love you in Jesus' name. God bless you and welcome to the family.